Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk for a Friday Mailbag Special. My thanks to mega supporter Kevin Hendrickson for suggesting I do such an episode. This is the show where we talk general aviation for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott, and each week I hear from many of you, but there's often not enough time to include all of your emails in the weekly show. And I have a particularly good collection I want to share with you. Most of them are in response to episode 261, in which we discussed a fatal Bonanza crash near the Westchester County Airport, in which the pilot had an engine failure, but took a very long time to declare an emergency. And also in response to 262, when we talked with Tom Turner about a study showing that partial power loss is three times more likely than complete engine failure, and we talked about why partial power loss seems to cause more accidents than complete engine failures. So if you didn't hear those episodes, check them out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 262 and 263. And here's our first email, and this comes from an FAA employee who works as an aviation safety analyst and asked to remain anonymous. That person wrote, Hi Max, I appreciate your comments in the latest episode regarding the pilot's reluctance to declare an emergency, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. There is no consequence and only benefit to declaring an emergency. To keep the message short, I'm a human factors analyst and consultant with the FAA's air traffic organization, Human Performance Team. I've had the same discussion with colleagues while looking at data from voluntary safety reporting systems like NASA's ASRS, and I've concluded that their reluctance to file stems from something more than a fear of repercussion, but also that declaring emergency means something has gone wrong and it might have been my fault. Pilots spend so much time ensuring that they get every detail of their flight right in pre-flight planning, maintaining situational awareness, and making sound decisions while airborne, that to say to the world, this situation has gone south and I have myself to blame, takes a lot to overcome. What I've been recommending to anyone who will listen is that pilots adopt the newer phraseology for declaring emergency, which is requesting priority handling. This results in the same service provided by ATC. They still ask for a number of souls on board and fuel remaining, and you can still deviate as needed, but you don't need to say the words, I'm declaring an emergency. Hopefully by asking for priority handling, the mental hurdle to get to where you're getting that extra benefit of controller assistance isn't so significant. Thanks, Max. I appreciate you and the contributions you've made to the community. I should also say that priority handling is a term used by ATC to provide special handling for flights such as a medevac or VIP movement, so it's not necessarily synonymous with an emergency aircraft. The AIM refers to declaring emergency, squawking 7700, or saying mayday on the radio. That said, ATC can declare on your behalf, and if you give them all the puzzle pieces, I have engine issues, I need priority handling, etc., they'll put it together and consider you an emergency aircraft. I recommend a pilot be as transparent as possible in their communication and state their intention. But if it's between saying nothing or asking for special handling, at least doing the latter gets the message communicated to ATC quicker. Now that is an awesome email. Thanks so much for sending that to me. And I'd like to encourage anyone else who works at the FAA or any other safety agencies, if you have uh, tips like that, please pass them along to me. Here's an email from Patreon supporter Sam Dawson. He's a supporter of the show. He says, another great show with great points. The reluctance of pilots to declare an emergency is frustrating. About the same evening as this crash, I was flying and I heard a well-known foreign carrier check in with New York Center. They had a passenger with a possible heart attack being attended to by a doctor on board. New York Center asked if they were declaring emergency and the pilot replied, negative. I really wanted to key the microphone and shout, you have a passenger with a bleep possible heart attack. That's a bleep emergency. Now, in instrument training, I will often give the student a similar scenario. We discuss the scenario first on the ground. I give the student an engine failure close to a non-towered airport. They enter direct two, execute and fly to the airport, and then enter a 360 over the approach end. In the interest of safety, I have them flip up the goggles at about a thousand feet AGL and land. If there is conflicting traffic, we stop the scenario. In the simulator, I give the scenario down to 500 feet, down to 300 feet, (laughs) man, that would be tough, which adds to your point about keeping altitude, if necessary, as for pilot's discretion. I had mentioned in the show that pilots might want to stay higher in an emergency than those altitudes assigned by ATC. Anyway, Sam continues, one other point in these situations, looking at the pictures of the accident aircraft, it seemed to have steam gauges. 
These are powered by an engine-driven vacuum pump, emphasis on engine-driven. As the engine fails, so will the attitude indicator and the directional gyro. This is not mentioned very often in training, if at all. The failure of the AI and the DG is much more disorienting in real life than it is in training when the instructor covers them up. I highly encourage instructors to incorporate this into their simulator training, listening to the tapes. This may have happened toward the end of the accident sequence. Another great show, Keep the Sunny Side Up, Sam. And I just want to underscore one of Sam's points, which is that when gyros fail, often they spin down very, very, very slowly over perhaps five minutes, and they slowly start to tilt. That's very insidious as it makes it very difficult for pilots to detect that the gyros have failed until they've already reached an unusual attitude. And here's another email from Sam. He writes about the runway incursion that occurred at JFK that we talked about recently. He writes, Max, let me preface what I will write by saying I don't know everything that happened, just that an airplane ended up where it shouldn't be. It seems American recently changed their procedure. The procedure described has been normal at the last few airlines where I worked. It does demand that as I worked earlier, the first officer figure out what task is most important and not let themselves become rushed. The better captains will also adjust their taxi speed and perhaps taxi slower if the FO is being overwhelmed. Finally, there normally is a relief pilot who can be tasked with making the announcement as well. That is actually the normal procedure where I work. Again, this is a wake-up call for me and all pilots. Do what is most important at that time. Aviate, navigate, then communicate, even on the ground. On a totally different subject, I think I mentioned recently I did an IPC split between a Redbird full motion simulator and a Piper PA-28. During the pre-brief, the instructor and I discussed doing a vacuum pump failure at some point during the simulator portion, followed by a partial panel approach. The instructor gave me the failure during the worst possible time during a missed approach. Even knowing the vacuum pump would fail at some point, I was in a partial panel unusual attitude before I realized what was going on. I was able to recover, but it was close, and I'm a very experienced pilot with a good deal of instrument time. I would highly recommend that any instrument pilot especially when flying a steam gauge airplane, find a simulator and have the instructor set up this scenario. It is nothing like doing it in the airplane where the instructor covers up the instruments. And if you're an instrument instructor, try to find a simulator that you can incorporate into training and include this scenario. Keep the sunny side up. Thanks so much for that, Sam. And from a mega supporter, Arjun Guraj, he writes, Hey Max, hope all is well. Great show this week. I have to totally agree with your analysis of the tragic Westchester crash. I would add one thing. I believe most pilots, especially GA, fail to cross-check some engine parameters. Most will look at CHTs, of course, and fixate on EGTs that mean nothing, but maybe some don't check battery trends and oil pressure trends. I make it a habit to look at my oil pressure every flight and compare to other flights prior to departure, but call me paranoid. But it is rare for oil pressure to suddenly go to nothing immediately, other than in catastrophic engine failure situations, such as a thrown rod, spun shaft, etc., and that would be obvious. I think we shall never know in this accident, but it would be helpful to see what the oil pressures were in prior flights. For me, a loss of oil pressure slowly is an insidious, nefarious event and requires immediate attention. Watching the trends might prevent late action. Just my thoughts. He also writes that he enjoys the videos that I post for Patreon supporters, including the most recent one, which was uh, with a 360 camera, the GoPro Max. He says, I bought one myself and have been experimenting. Question, how do you download the .360 files that are chaptered and join them all together for longer vids? I use Adobe Premiere Pro and I cannot figure it out. Thanks for the news and education, Arjun. Well, Arjun, it took me many, many hours to figure out how to get useful 360 videos, and the internet was not particularly helpful. I gave up the first time I tried, and tried again a year later, and finally figured it out. Here's what I do. I first open my .dot360 files in GoPro Player. I turn off world lock and horizontal leveling, and then export that as an equi rectangular file in the HVEC 4K format. I then import those files into Final Cut Pro. And then I specify the orientation numerically with the X, Y, Z, and the zoom levels. I then copy and paste that orientation or that view from each file to all of the other equirectangular files in Final Cut Pro. Hope that helps. I'm guessing you can use a similar process in Adobe Premiere. By the way, the project sizes get huge when you start moving the orientation 
and pan the video from one view to another. You can probably get smaller project sizes by just doing cuts from one view to another view rather than panning. Hope that helps. And here's an email from David Stites. He writes, Hi Max, I love your podcast. Last week's episode on partial engine failure with Tom Turner really hit home for me and highlighted the need to stay proficient on single engine operation. In November, I was doing some practice approaches at Watsonville, California in my Baron 55 when I lost my right engine on the missed approach procedure. It presented itself differently than in training where the instructor chops the power suddenly with mixture and the aircraft sharply lurches toward the dead engine, making it quite obvious what happened. In my case, I had a very slow and subtle RPM rollback until the right tachometer read zero. I didn't initially notice this, but I became aware that the airplane didn't feel right, even though it was trimmed up and the performance was lethargic. I started searching for reasons and eventually discovered that I had a partial engine failure. The right engine was still running and producing minimal power. Nothing had departed the airplane, but it took me a few moments to realize what happened and then run the drill. I made it back to San Martin safely with no damage to anything except my wallet. Later analysis showed it was a broken throttle cable. I had all six replaced as they were most likely the originals from 1964. Keep up the good work. And here's email from Chris Schlanger. He writes, Hi Max, I could not ignore the irony of a discussion about low altitude engine failures right before you close the show with a song, You Can Always Go Around. Well, ideally, yes. In all semi-seriousness, that got me thinking. It'd be great to hear a discussion about engine issues at altitude. Troubleshooting is always suggested, but rarely elaborated upon. Turbo problems, high altitude mag misfiring, fuel vaporization at high altitudes, etc., would all be great nuggets to share with your listeners. Anyway, keep up the good work. Thanks. Chris, thanks for that suggestion. We'll keep that in mind for a future show. And from Patreon supporter Dan Morris, he writes, Max, the new airplane, which by the way is the 1975 Cardinal RG, is so much fun, and I took myself and my two boys to Nebraska for Thanksgiving. It was nice to be able to use it for the reason I bought it. I recently listened to episode 262 in the partial engine turn back. As luck would have it, I had this exact experience just after the new year. I'm sending my flight aware track so that you can give it a look. Essentially, just after dialing back to cruise altitude, 25 inches and 2500 RPM, I noticed a considerable drop in RPM. It went from 2500 to about 1600, gave it some throttle, pushed in the mixture, nothing changed. Immediately made the determination to turn back to KTRL. We were about two miles away and at 1,800 feet. With the partial power, I knew I would make it okay. As the gentleman in the episode says, I didn't waste any time tinkering, tried a couple things, and made the call. I had a co-worker and his son with me. Son's first time ever in a plane. He will have quite a story. After getting back to work, the guy had already told the story. I had many people ask me how on earth I was able to handle the situation, just had to say it came down to training. A good chunk of that training comes in the form of listening to your podcast. Thanks again for all you do, Dan. Well, Dan, I'm super happy that that worked out. And thanks for supporting Aviation News Talk. And from another supporter, patron supporter, Drew Henry. He wrote, first, I want you to know how much I appreciate your Aviation News Talk podcast. I particularly find that the candor with which you discuss various accidents and the situations that causes them helps cement the importance of careful pre-flight planning. Your recent discussion of the impossible turn also helped me think about what actions I take when doing that departing climb from an airport should I lose the engine. While I have 250 hours during the last year and a half as I completed my private and IFR rating, I know I still have so much to learn. Your podcast materials are very helpful. Perhaps you've spoken on this topic, but I've been thinking a lot about the entire process of flight training and checkride testing. I specifically chose my private and instrument training programs because I had a primary and secondary instructor, then had a third person to do phase checks. This allowed me to get the perspective of different instructors who were well-coordinated and complemented one another. But I recognize that not all students get the same training experience. Instructors in schools have different approaches for training for the ACS, and examiners have slightly different ways that they test against the standards. But once we pass and get our license, we are all let loose to fly. So specifically, the question I'm thinking about now is how to keep learning beyond prepping for my biennial flight review, which is now called just the flight review. What are good learning practices, strategies, and disciplines that a new or any pilot should develop? Forgive me if you've already addressed this in one of your shows. If so, and if you have a moment, please point me to it. Keep doing what you're doing, Max. I deeply appreciate benefiting from your work. Hope to see you at Palo Alto sometime. You might get a kick out of hearing how I failed 
but then passed my IFR check ride all during the same flight. That was an emotional roller coaster. Yes, true. Definitely tell me about that. So here are some ideas on what you might want to do between the two years that intervene between flight reviews. I would suggest you might want to, for example, volunteer to fly for a group like Angel Flight, which we talked about in episode 212, or Pilots in Pause that we talked about in episode 248. Flying for a volunteer organization will really help you up your game and become more disciplined about your flight. Plus, it gives you a mission that will energize you and give you a purpose to your flying. Back in the 1990s, I was very active with Los Medicos Voladares, or LMV, which flew volunteer docks and dentists on four-day trips to provide free services in underserved areas of Mexico. Now, my flying became very disciplined as I had to do more planning and attend to the needs of as many as five other people in the Cessna 210 that I owned at the time. I got so involved that I became president of the organization for two years, and I even built their first website back in December of 1995 when web browsers first started to become common. You might also think about working on new ratings and certificates. For example, learn to fly a tailwheel aircraft or that nice new Diamond DA-42 twin at the West Valley Flying Club that we just talked about in episode 263 that came out earlier this week that talked all about Diamond DA-42s. You might also do something fun like take a helicopter lesson or get a seaplane rating or maybe get your commercial certificate. And if you do, maybe someday you'll end up as a CFI. But most of all, keep pushing the limits of your knowledge and make sure you're having fun while you're doing it. Now, if you'd like to send me any feedback or emails, here's the way I'd like to ask you to do it. Go out right now to aviationnewstalk.com, go to the top of the page and click on contact, and then send me your email. If you do it that way, I'm guaranteed to see it. And then I'll try to read those emails on the show. Now, here's a review. I haven't read these for quite some time that somebody posted in the Apple iTunes review section for podcast. This comes from Cash Dad. That's Cash K-A-S-H. He writes, Maximum Thanks Max. First, I'd like to thank you for your devotion to the promotion of GA and aviation in general. You're clearly passionate about this pursuit, and that enthusiasm is reflected in every episode of the podcast. I found the podcast at a critical phase of my flight training while working toward my IFR ticket and eventually Cirrus transition training, all successfully completed. I'm in South Florida, earned my private in 04, and have logged over a thousand hours of EFR, mostly cross-country flying all over the southeast in the Cessna 182. The instrument training really tested some deeply ingrained muscle memory, and I was struggling early in the process. I used your library of podcasts to keep my mind immersed in aviation facts and aviation speak, like a literal hanger rat in the corner soaking up every word. The total transition was as much about a culture of professionalism and safety as it was about actual tasks and standards. It worked, and I appreciate your help. I now get to fly a rented 2016 SR-22 several times a month with about 10 hours solo PIC time so far. The Cirrus is a fabulous example of attention to detail by talented engineers and designers. Anyway, I hope I'm not getting your fingers sticky with all this syrupy praise, but I sincerely appreciate your contributions, Safe Skies. Well, thanks so much for posting that rather kind review on Apple iTunes. Now, anyone else who's listening, if you have a free moment, please go ahead and leave a five-star review for Aviation News Talk in whatever app that you're using to listen to me now. That way, other people may be influenced by your recommendation and give us a listen. Speaking of listening, this is a listener-supported show. So if you enjoy this episode and you're getting some entertainment of value from it, please take the two or three minutes it takes to sign up to become a member and join the club to support Aviation News Talk. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and when you do, I'll read your name on the show. And if you'd like to make a one-time donation, just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And of course, there are links for both of those websites in our show notes. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember, you can always go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right coming down. Don't wait until your side's baby sliding upside down. You can always